This video is sponsored by EcoFlow. Why is this rocket spinning so fast? Maybe it's because the fins are misaligned. Maybe it's because I did a bad job building it. Maybe I just enjoy blurry, smeary video because I'm working with NASA to conceal the fact that the Earth is flat. The truth is much more disappointing. These are the fins that flew on the rocket you just saw. And after measuring their misalignment with a laser level, that is to say, how straight are the fins on that tube? You wanna know what that number was? 0 0.1 degrees. I run a YouTube channel. I like capturing the best footage that I possibly can of my rockets. How am I supposed to do that if 0.1 degrees of misalignment in my fins results in 900 degrees per second of roll rate on the rocket? I'll give you a few solutions. First, what if we just control the rocket with active fins? This is simple enough, right? I have experience in guidance and control, and instead of moving the motor at the bottom of the rocket, I just tilt a set of fins. I've actually done this, by the way. Here's a test video from a secret project where the rocket uses movable fins at the back to roll 90 degrees. This totally works. I have a good idea of how to simulate it, so what is the issue? The first and largest issue is that the cost of failure for this type of system is pretty high. If you have active control that fails, there's a good chance that you can rip your rocket apart in the process if you're doing like Mach 5. It's worth remembering, I'm trying to design all of these things to eventually do a space shot, so something that can scale up easily is important. The second is that fins are actually quite hard to simulate. Uh, it requires quite a bit of CFD and potentially wind tunnel time to get a good idea of what these fins are going to do at different flight regimes. And the third con is that a spinning rocket is a good thing. Stability is difficult in the stratosphere and mesosphere. You have almost no air to work with up there. And as your Mach number increases, the shock waves moving down the vehicle make fins less effective. So the reason we spin the rocket is to improve stability in the upper atmosphere. Once again, designing for space shot. All right, so if the rocket needs to spin, let's try a different idea. What about a 360 camera? A 360 camera works by using multiple lenses and multiple camera sensors and stitching those images digitally together. This allows you to theoretically rotate your frame or your camera shot through a 360 degree field of view. A spin stabilized rocket can rotate at like 5 hertz, 10 hertz, maybe plus, and at 10 hertz that's 3600 degrees per second of rotation. I'm not super convinced that the stitching and like digital processing of a 360 degree camera is going to work great in that scenario. It might, but there's also one other thing that I want to try, and that's the most important part of this. I have a solution that I want to do, and I'm just trying to lead you up to it. So here's my pitch. The rocket needs to spin, and we want a good camera shot. So what if we just unspin the camera. And here's how I think we do it. We mount the cameras on a shelf that spins around a bearing. On this little shelf, we mount the cameras, batteries, control electronics, and a motor to spin the whole assembly around. Is this overcomplicated? Hmm, maybe, but I am an engineer, which means that it is my job to overcomplicate things. So let's build this. This is the gear train between the brushless motor that drives the spinning shelf and the central tube. Because these brushless motors spin so fast, the ratio of the entire gear stack is about 1 million billion trillion to 1. 
Programming the ESC is an important part of this process, and it was around this point that I noticed spinning at low speed was okay, but going from a standstill to spinning at low speed was pretty jumpy. Regardless, this is all a prototype, so let's build out the rest of this thing. The whole assembly rides on this bearing, which is rated to about 1,500 pounds of dynamic loading, which is perfect for a rocket. The inner tube is actually three tubes epoxied together to increase strength. We're taking the bending loads from a four inch tube and sending it through half the diameter, so this inner part needs to be strong. The tube gets cut down to length with the chop saw, and then I milled two attachment bulkheads to connect it to the rocket. These bulkheads will get epoxied into the fiberglass rocket body, and to help with adhesion, I turned grooves into the side of them on the lathe. Now let's finish this thing. I mounted two cameras pointing down the side of the vehicle and one pointing out at the horizon. The battery here is actually three separate LiPo cells that I tied together in series. The computer with the IMU is one of the spark boards that I built for my micro three-stage TVC rocket, and the board is running a program which looks at the roll axis error and then uses a simple proportional controller to spin up the motor and correct for it. This gives us small steady state errors, but overall good performance. Finally, I took the whole assembly, put it on the lathe, and got to testing. This is a prototype. It's a first draft. It's got misalignments, it's got flaws, I'm not super stoked about it, but it has a great personality. One of the biggest problems here is that the brushless motor I selected can't rotate the assembly slower than about 40 degrees per second. So what that means is when this whole thing spins up, it does so with a really intense jump before we get spinning. It also means that if the vehicle's rotating slower than 40 degrees per second, but not zero, we get jumpy and inconsistent motion. But like I said, this thing is a prototype, it's just a proof of concept, the most important thing is getting it to flight so that we can move on to version two. And so while I prep this rocket and get it ready to fly in the desert, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, EcoFlow. EcoFlow creates mobile power stations and batteries to help keep things running when you don't have access to grid power. Specifically for me, and maybe some of you, that means having access to wall outlet power while I'm out in the field flying rockets. Cordless drills are great, laptops have batteries, but all of this is a limited power source. Nothing can really match the assurance of having an unlimited power source in the field. EcoFlow can do this because they also produce solar panels, like these massive 400 watt ones that I have for the Delta Pro. These panels do a great job of keeping your battery charged throughout the day so that you never need to worry about running out of power. I've been using the EcoFlow Delta Pro for a little while, and it has been fantastic at keeping my computers charged, charging up cameras, basically providing any power needs in the field. EcoFlow is currently having Black Friday sales ending on November 28th, and you can save up to 50% via the Amazon Early Black Friday page, as well as the link in the description. Thanks again to EcoFlow for sponsoring today's video, and if you'd like to check them out, you can get up to 50% off until November 28th by using the link in the description down below. Now, let's go out to the desert and launch this thing. Okay, uh, the rocket is on the rail. Let's talk a little bit about what we're doing here today. This is the camera spinner moves the camera back and forth like that. There's a horizon cam, there's one down looker cam, and then there's a second down looker cam here. They're recording at a bunch of different frame rates. It's kind of a sketchy design, but I'm pretty happy with it. Honestly, I thought this would be the weak point of the rocket, but it turns out to be really stiff. And the weak point turns out to be the avionics bay here. These cameras don't spin. This is just part of the avionics bay from Send It as it was. So it'll provide a nice point of comparison for, you know, what spinning versus non-spinning video looks like. And then down here are the Lumineer fins with this additional tilted fin. So this is a five degree tilt. Simulations say that that brings up our spin rate just a little bit that sits in a nicer range for the motor to control. And that's pretty much it. So this is going to 13, 14,000 feet today. It's going like Mach 1.2. That's about, that's about it. Good luck.
Okay. This launch was beautiful. A perfectly straight, clean ascent to about 4,200 meters. Ava fired the apogee charge to get the drogue chutes out, and then fired at the main chute charge at about 500 meters for a soft touchdown. And now it's time to answer the question you're probably asking, which is how did the camera spinner work? To which I would respond, first of all, don't ask that question. You don't need to know, trust me, bro. It's fine, it worked great. Do I even need to show you the footage? The real answer is that it, it it didn't work great. Right, so it really didn't work. Um, this was not a successful flight in terms of the thing that I wanted to have happen. It was a successful flight in the sense that the structure was strong enough that it held together. I was a little bit concerned about that. The camera spinner did activate and it tried to work. It obviously didn't work great. And we got the rocket back in one piece. I mean, it's behind me now. So in that sense, it was successful, but not really in the thing that I wanted to test. The first thing that stands out to me is that the camera spinner is fully inactive for the first few seconds of flight. The rocket spins up and the spinner seems to do nothing to correct for it. My theory here is that the ESC has a sleep function. This is the speed controller that controls the brushless motor. The sleep function puts the ESC to bed, basically. It says good night to the ESC after about maybe 10, 15 minutes of inactivity in terms of the PWM signal that we send to the speed controller that eventually goes to the motor. Basically what this means is that if we sit powered on but idle for a little while, the ESC says, okay, I'm gonna take a nap, and then it goes offline until a big spike in the PWM signal happens. I knew this would happen, so I tried to program in a bump function, which basically every 90 seconds or so sent a little spike in the PWM signal to keep the ESC awake. Either that didn't work or something else happened, and I'm not totally sure what that is yet, but basically the ESC wakes up like, at about 2,000 meters and says, oh, I should probably start correcting for the roll now. And what happens then is that we've got all of this accumulated roll, we're adding up roll and we don't have a good like anti windup function. And so the ESC D spins across several different rotations because it senses that we've accumulated a ton of roll. This is sort of an inefficiency in the programming that I did for this uh, and can probably be improved in the future. For the one or two seconds that this thing does end up stabilizing the roll axis, it looks pretty cool. I'm actually fairly happy with how that part of the video looks. And as the rocket nears Apogee, you can see the device is trying to stabilize around a certain point. We just don't have a speed on the motor that is slow enough to match that rate. And I was hoping to avoid something like this with those tilted fins at the base of the vehicle, but clearly my modeling isn't good enough or something else is off. It almost doesn't matter what the failure exactly is here because the lesson is the same no matter what. And it's that this motor is not the right choice. I have put way too much work into this device to give up on it so quickly. So I have some ideas going forward. One of them is this little tiny stepper motor. This is a NEMA-8. This is a little micro-sized stepper motor. And one thing that stepper motors do really well is move at very slow speeds and they're quite precise. You see stepper motors in CNC's, you see them on 3D printers, you see them in lots of robotics. And I am fairly certain that we can take this existing camera ring, which albeit is quite dusty and uh, has a bunch of dirt from the desert, 
Clean it up a little bit, get rid of this massive gear train and brushless motor and replace it with the stepper. The stepper just barely fits in there and that might be able to get us over the finish line of having really smooth, stable video on the way up. I am not yet ready to give up on the idea of spinning the cameras instead of using a 360 camera. It's a very cool device. I like the tech behind it. It doesn't necessarily make the most sense in terms of risk or cost or something like that, but none of this stuff makes sense, man. It's model rocketry. We do these things because they're really fun and because you learn interesting stuff along the way, and I'm learning a lot, like most of my projects. I also wanted to mention a few things about this device and the flight itself. The first is that for this device, that central tube is really important, much more than I gave it time for in the video. This tube, although the gear is broken on it, is really, really important, and uh, I can't believe that it worked. Uh, even if the spinner didn't work, um, structurally, this was one of the things I was most worried about. You can see me talking about it when I'm at the launch pad explaining what the flight is gonna be about, but the weak point on the flight ended up being the avionics bay. That's where most of the rocket wiggled about. There was no wiggle at all around this section. And so the way that worked is those two bulkheads sat one side on the other. And then in some of the footage, you can see a 3 8 inch threaded rod that goes all the way through the center. And then we take that thing, we take that rod and we tighten it down unbelievably tight. It is crazy. It took me about 30 minutes to get the rod unscrewed or just to get it like unseized uh, after the flight. So basically you just tighten this as much as you possibly can, put a ton of compression and it seems to have worked. The cool thing about that too is that this is a pass through. It's totally hollow in the center. And apart from that rod, you could run pyro wires, you could run communications wires, antennas, uh, ignition wires, all sorts of stuff through the center of this while the rest of the assembly spins around on a bearing. So for revision too, we're definitely gonna keep this in the center of the design and I'll probably keep most of the specific parts too. Something else I wanted to mention here is this thing that I call the Smoky Joe. So the Smoky Joe is a little assembly that sits right below the nose cone. It actually is the nose cone of the rocket and it screws in on this like 3.5 millimeter threaded rod. There's an AVA computer, there's a ton of thermocouples and thermocouple amps. We've also got uh, telemetry radio, GPS antennas. It's basically a full avionics stack, but mounted on a rod. Um, I'm not gonna give too much away about what this is, but boy, it shouldn't be that hard to figure it out. But this thing unfortunately died on the launch pad, so we don't have uh, any good data from it. So it's gonna have to get flown again before it becomes useful at all. Anyway, that is most of the things that I wanted to cover here. I hope you enjoyed watching me build something really complicated and having it not quite work. That's a pretty common theme on this channel if you're new here. But the other common theme is that I usually don't give up after the first try, I think. I hope that's a common theme. Either way, uh, I'm gonna be back. We're gonna try this thing again. I'm gonna get that buttery smooth footage. I am so confident in it. So thank you very much for watching. Thanks to all the folks who support this project on Patreon and through the BPS Discord. Thanks as well to EcoFlow for sponsoring today's video. And thank you to you for watching. My name is Joe Barnard. May your skies be blue and your winds be low. Psst. If you, if you, if you, um, if you want to see the raw flight footage, I've also put that in the description down below. You can watch the whole thing. Okay, thanks for watching. Bye!